Dear friends, we have in our Gospel reading this morning Jesus' famous rebuke to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus is telling his disciples that he has to go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. This causes consternation, especially in Peter, for he cannot see any way in which this can happen to the Messiah, and he has just exclaimed that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Jesus goes on to say, You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now what are those human things, and why might they be linked this morning to the references to the covenant with Abraham? Let's remind ourselves about who the Satan is. The Satan is the accuser, the one who points the finger, the one who attacks and goads and provokes. More broadly, the Satan is the prince of this world, in charge of all worldly matters. In other words, worldly matters are the realm of accusation and blame, which means that to succeed in the world is to occupy a place where you are not accused and you are not blamed. In other words, it is to become popular and successful. To succeed in the world is to find a certain sort of safety, but it is not an eternal safety. As Jesus goes on to say, what does it profit if we gain the whole world but lose our own soul? So there is a contrast between succeeding in worldly terms, becoming rich, popular, successful and so on, and walking in the way of Christ, in the way of the cross. So if the realm of the world, of worldliness, is this realm of accusation and blame, and a consequent search for safety and security, is that all there is? Simply individual human beings and the enemy? Biblically, no. Biblically, there is a much larger category of creatures that are also involved in this dynamic, and they go under the heading of the principalities and powers. So, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now this language, put simply, is how the New Testament talks about what we would call politics, which is where the language of nations comes in. In scripture, nations are real things. They are created, so it is correct to call them creatures, and they can sin and fall and be redeemed just like human beings. So when God says to Abraham that he will be the father of many nations, this isn't simply saying that Abraham will have lots and lots of children, although that's also true, more numerous than the stars in the sky and so on. It's saying that many nations will be born from Abraham, and nations are real things. This is something that we often miss in modern Western society. We've been so captured by the idea that we're all individuals, isolated atoms bouncing off each other, that we no longer see that we are parts of something larger. Specifically, we are members of nations. Now, this is not the same as members of a nation state. That's something that only really kicks off after the 17th century wars of religion. We can be members of a state in the same way that we can be customers of BT or a water company. That's not what's being referred to by the language of the nations in scripture. No, the language of the nations would refer, for us here in the forest, to England. It describes England as something spiritually real, something that exists separately to all the particular people living within the borders of a state marked out on a map. It refers to something that has a history and a personality and a soul. I sometimes think that a very large part of what causes our national church to have so many problems is that it has absorbed the secular idea that nations don't actually exist. It becomes hard to become a church of England if you don't believe that there is such a thing as England. So the nations are real, and the principalities and powers are real, and the enemy is real, and this is the context within which we are to navigate. This is the context in which we have to be prepared to take up our cross and follow Christ. The cross represents what happens when we follow the path of the kingdom, not the path or desires of any particular kingdom or nation or group within the world. Understanding this illuminates the nature of the choice that we face. We may be called to stand apart from our society, from the destination that our nation seeks to drive us towards. Caiaphas, the high priest at the time of the cruc crucifixion, says, It is better for one man to die than that the whole nation should perish. That is the voice of the world. Now this is not to say that we must never be patriotic. On the contrary, patriotism is an important Christian virtue. 
We are called to love the nations that we are part of, to honour our nation in the same way that we are called to honour our fathers and mothers, that our days might be long on this earth. Patriotism is a virtue, and we are to love the nation that we are part of, to honour and protect it. But we're called to love God all the more, and to recognise that there may come times when we have to serve the Lord and not the nation. That is the way of the cross. For if we go against the world, if we go against what the society around us believes, then we will suffer. In the end, we are citizens of another country. We are subjects of a heavenly kingdom, and our ultimate loyalty lies there. Now Peter has not yet learned the difference between the ways of the world and the way of Christ, and so he objects to the idea that Jesus might be killed by the worldly authorities. It's because he runs those two things together that Jesus rebukes him. May we learn the difference in our own lives and be given the grace to walk in the way of the cross. Amen.